Thank you for joining us for another edition of Against the Current. I'm Dan Proft, and we're coming to you, as we always do, live from the Skyline Club atop the Old Republic Building in downtown Chicago. My guest this week on Against the Current is Chicago Tribune editorial board member, Kristen McQuarrie. Kristen, thanks so much for joining thanks us. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. I want to start with something that's a uh, bit controversial, um, and you were at the center of this controversy. You, uh, according to some, manufactured this controversy, this piece that you wrote, uh, for the Tribune, where you suggested metaphorically that perhaps the only thing that will save the city of Chicago from its political leadership is some kind of natural disaster on the order of what happened in New Orleans with the Katrina hurricane that allowed for New Orleans to do a bit of a reset, particularly as it related to their K through 12 education system in the city. and. Um, I found the reaction, the overreaction, that you were actually suggesting, like wishing a hurricane to come to Chicago or something, a bit silly. But it was surprising to me how many people didn't take it metaphorically, how many people actually accused you of calling for a natural disaster to, to befall the city of Chicago, and how long and how intense the reaction was nationally to the piece that you wrote. Explain the, a little bit of the background on the piece and your reaction to the reaction it generated. Well, it was primarily a piece on the city's and the school's finances. I mean, that was the intention. We had just had Forrest Claypool into the editorial board, the new CEO of CPS. Fresh kid on the scene. He was just he's a new, new reformer. You can't, you can't blame him for all, yeah. the, all of the problems at CPS, but he, he you know, does have sort of a credential as being someone who turns governments around. So I was again sort of disappointed, as I am oftentimes when people come and talk to us about finances, that he was backing the current school's budget for the next year, which was like smoke and mirrors and money from Springfield and more scoop and toss borrowing, which is very dangerous. And, and it, uh, a billion dollars short. The, the, it, the, the budget yes, for CPS. Yes, I mean, it's going to run out of money. The schools are going to run out of money by um, the time they owe a pension payment in January. So it was that. And then we also had the New Orleans mayor come in and talk a little bit about the reset button that got pushed, um, that Katrina forced the city to reevaluate everything, to break labor union contracts, to lay people off. Um, they charterized all of the schools. So yes, I wrote a piece, but... Um, I used it as a metaphor, and what I heard loud and clear, especially from people who suffered through Katrina, was even that was distasteful and pushing the envelope too far. And you know, don't use my tragedy as your metaphor. So it was it was a jarring piece, and it caused absolutely you know national outrage and social media shaming and people wishing that I would drown in a bathtub and lots of people offering to do it themselves, um, wishing that my children would drown. Hmm. Um, it's measured. Um, and so here's the, here's the thing about that piece, if I'm recalling it correctly. Didn't, in the piece, you explicitly say, of course I'm not, or words to this effect, of course I am not wishing a Katrina on the city of Chicago. It was more to uh, essentially provide an a way to convey how frustrated you were and how frustrated as a reflection how frustrated so many families in Chicago are in Illinois uh, are with respect to the intransigence to change of CPS and city government yes but I still you know when you write something that is so wildly taken out of context I mean I have to accept responsibility that obviously my metaphor did not work the entire point of the piece was lost and um, it, it it was too jarring a metaphor to use even to describe the, the city and, and my wishing for, you know, when I, when I was writing it, I was thinking of my reset button being, you know, like junk status. Finally, when the city hits junk status, that will, you know, yeah. move people in the right direction. The mayor's runoff election, I thought maybe that would move him in a new direction. The city council got 13 or 14 new members. I thought maybe that would move the city in a new direction. Instead, one of the first votes they took was more scoop and toss borrowing. So all of that sort of pent up frustration came out in that column, which if you read our page and you read me regularly, it probably wasn't as surprising. But to people around the country who'd never heard of me, you know, it was very offensive. Well, but it wasn't just around the country. Didn't you receive flack at home? I mean. I I mean, with in Chicago, oh, your sure. colleagues oh, sure. who've yeah. read your stuff regularly, who know what you write and the point that you're trying to make routinely when it comes to discussions of city government, of CPS finances. Oh, sure. There was a lot of pushback and there was a lot of silence and there was, um, you know, the newsroom was kind of in an uproar. Um, it, of course, did not show up on the page 
without being edited. You know, my direct right. boss is an Something African American Something lost woman. in the story. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, you know, it was edited by. So, so the you sent this piece. I mean, you don't <laughs> post the stuff yourself. You send it up through the food chain. So you have an editorial page editor. You have. Uh, of other rungs on the ladder that review this piece before it goes live. Sure. And I mean, I, my direct report when I write columns is Marsha Lithcott, um, and then it went to two other editors, and then it went to another colleague on the editorial board who was in the middle of doing a whole piece on the 10-year anniversary of Katrina. No red flags. So I don't know whether that just says we're all out of touch, perhaps, but, um, you know, it, it was not just my piece going on the page. And the importance of making the point that your kind of direct report, for lack of a better description, as an African-American female, is that all of the outrage was of a racial nature. Oh, yes. It was essentially saying, you know, you don't care about black people who were killed or other, in, in Katrina or lost their homes or were otherwise devastated by that natural disaster. And so the reaction, not just your reaction, but also the reaction of that little ecosystem of people who all saw, saw the piece before it posted. What was the reaction? Yeah, I mean, the reaction was that I was literally calling for the death and destruction of African Americans in Chicago, which yeah, but, is- but, 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 but well, right, I understand the hysteria, the overreaction, the melodrama contrived, I think, in large measure, uh, at least in the Twitterverse, where they're always looking for the new outrage to, you know, kind of heap their moral scorn on somebody, even if it's somebody that is, a, is with them on a number of issues. But, but internally at the Tribune, all those other people who saw the piece, I didn't see the moral indignation directed at Bruce Dole, the editorial page editor, or Marshall Lithcott. So what do they have to say about it? I think there, I think there was probably. Um, I mean, they definitely had my back within the walls of the Tribune. And um, I mean, to this day, they still think it was a solid piece. I don't know how to, you know, they still think it was, you know, provocative journalism, yes, but in any way was, is, was the radicalization of what people interpreted my column to be accurate? No, and I have pushed back against that and will because that is a, um, that is not who I am, that's not what I wrote, and it's, that is an inaccurate interpretation of what I actually said. But see, so in this climate, I mean, you've been a journalist for a long time. Prior to the Tribune, you were at the Chicago News Co-op. You were at the Daily Southtown. You've been writing opinion pieces. You've been covering state government and a variety of issues for a long time. Have you noticed a change in the tenor and tolerance for opinion, provocative opinions, more recently, where uh, something like this is purposefully taken out of context to fit it into this kind of construct of somebody's being victimized or everything needs to be looked at through a racial lens and no matter what your intentions are, no matter what the actual written words are, we're going to fit it into this context. And so how does that impact your ability to be an editorial writer where you're trying to predict the most ridiculous interpretations of what you write? It becomes a, a bit stultifying, doesn't it? It can. I mean, I think that's a problem on the left and the right. I think we've gotten to a point where people really only read what they agree with. Mm -hmm. And so you end up with this very divisive culture where people cannot tolerate others' opinions. And that's on the far left, and that's on the far right, too. I mean, you have very conservative viewpoints and, and people who only watch Fox News. And then you have very liberal people who can't even tolerate Fox News. And it creates, yeah, this, this very divisive culture. Is it any different from when I started? I don't know that it's any different. I think for me, making the transition from being a news reporter to an opinion writer has been sort of um, maybe surprising for people who, know, who thought they knew me because there's kind of a perception that if you work in a newsroom and you are part of the mainstream media, you definitely have a more moderate to liberal position on things. Well, sure, because that represents 90% of your colleagues. I, I don't know that it does. I just know that it doesn't represent me. And once I started actually writing what my opinions were, I've had people, you know, good friends, just like horrified that I might, you know, be a Republican or have voted for Bruce Rauner or, you know, it's kind of tempered some relationships. I'll tell you, um, I mean, just point of order, I only watch Ed Schultz and Rachel Maddow, <laughs> even though I'm a conservative, because it's penance for my sins. So, I mean, at least I'm accountable. And I just wanted to note that for the record. Um, but, but speaking of uh, this whole reaction, 
and your friends. When I ran for office uh, back in 2010, you may recall I, I ran for governor. It was a bit, a bit of an ill-fated campaign. Um, but, I, and I say this. It's because you didn't take my advice, but we'll get to that later. What was the advice? I told you when you said you were running and your first. Well, first After you, you stopped laughing. First you had your yeah. drop the mic moment with your Illinois isn't fixed, it's broken. Where you Illinois know, isn't broken, it's fixed. I'm sorry, excuse me. You Please. thought your slogan was going to just allow you to march right in. Um, and it then you went have. on a tirade about CPS being, you know, a criminal enterprise. It is. <laughs> I told you that you needed to tone down Dan Proft. Oh, and you oh, listen to Miss Katrina, <laughs> Miss Demagog telling Dan Proft to tone down. Yeah. Ah. So anyway, yeah. sorry to interrupt. No. Back to your Oprah moment well, when you were running. Well, I, well, I want to go. Actually, now I want to go in a different direction. So, what about that though? You've written so many pieces on topic on pensions and on city finances and on CPS and on the state budget. And at some point, and I feel this way too, having been on the radio for the last half a dozen years and been in politics before, you feel like you're just shouting into the wilderness. Like, what will it take for people to wake up and recognize that their economic future lies in the balance with some of these decisions that are being made and they're just blithely going through life thinking somehow it's just gonna all work itself out. And so it almost encourages you to be more and more provocative to try and hit people in the head with a proverbial metaphorical metaphorical two by four so that they wake up and pay a little bit of attention because the you know graphs and the recitation of dry statistics doesn't seem to compel anyone to pay more attention than they've been paying for the last 40 years so is it, isn't that part of it is the the exasperation with people not paying attention to the destruction of their city and their state? I mean, it is for me, but obviously I'm in the minority. You know, there are still people today, or, you know, a couple days after the state's credit rating got dropped again, yeah. who still will defend the Democrats who had sole control of state government for 14 years. And over that time, the unfunded pension liability went from $43 billion to $111 billion. During that time, we had to kick poor people off of Medicaid because we couldn't afford it. I mean. I could go on and on, but the 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 constitution of people to still be able to defend that political structure, I just don't understand. I don't understand, and yes, I find it, I find it frustrating, and it's not something that I can just turn off. It really it bothers me. And so the reaction to all this, I mean, I saw some of the tweets, uh, the reaction to your column, uh, and so I wonder, just going back to uh, where I was before when I ran. And I tell this to candidates, I've run campaigns for a long time, I tell this to every candidate because it happens to everyone and it happened to me too, and I knew it would, which is you run for office, it's a bit of a clarifying event in a number of levels. One of the levels is you find out who your friends are and who they're not. So people who you thought would be heroic for you when you take a gambit like running for high office disappear and they don't do anything. Uh, people you didn't think, you know, maybe they'd help on the margins turn out to be heroic. People you didn't even know that you meet, which is kind of one of the cool things about politics and I presume journalism too. You get to meet uh, a lot of different people from a lot of different walks of life and that's kind of interesting. Um, people you didn't even know before you pursued a particular office or wrote a particular piece come out of the woodwork and become lifelong friends or at least uh, uh, you know, colleagues in some way, associates. And uh, that happened for me, for sure. That happened to me, for sure. And I wonder if that happened to you with this experience of being put in the crucible by the Twitterverse and you know, all of the hate mongering that goes on in, in the digital world. Sure, I mean, I know what, what most people saw was, was the outrage, but um, there was either silence from a lot of my friends and colleagues, or I did get probably two thirds of the email I received was supportive. You know, even people who said, you pushed it too far. I don't agree with what you said, but I know what you were trying to say. And, yeah. and, the, and the reaction you are getting is oversized for what you were trying to say. Um, so yes, it's been a clarifying moment. Yeah, but so isn't that interesting? Especially not just the people that disappear, but the people that are quietly supportive. I'm with you. <laughs> Don't tell anyone. And it goes to this larger problem about our politics in the city and the state, maybe nationally to some extent, but Illinois and Chicago, really the bad example. The Stockholm Syndrome, where we identify with our ruling class elites, kind of a corollary to the Stockholm Syndrome, perhaps. And people 
are unwilling to speak out, are unwilling to say what they know to be true because they're afraid of reprisal. And isn't that what perpetuates the system that we have in present? It's part of it. Um, I think it's, it's difficult to be bold. It really is. And so I don't necessarily begrudge those who kind of um, are participants from the sidelines. I think it's more incumbent on, you know, I have a column, they give me space in the newspaper, I'm going to say something and I'm going to be passionate about it and I'm not going to be silenced and I will just learn to have thicker skin as I move forward um, with, you know, the people who want to disagree with me and so outrageously so. And uh, just one other point on this. Didn't you uh, have to uh, sit down with like a, the Black Journalists Association to discuss your column to make sure that uh, you were uh, properly sensitive to uh, the reactions of those that were offering disproportionate reactions to the column? What was that like? Um, I mean, I was happy to sit down with them. They actually called for me to be fired. Okay, well, so, that's a little bit more than sit down. It's a little bit more than yeah. a sit down. Yeah, I mean, there was a there was a call for me to be fired, and then they sort of tempered it where they just wanted me to be suspended. Um, and my editors and I sat down and met with them, and um, I think they wanted to see more repercussions. But it was it's a little ironic coming from a journalist association. You know, we were supposed to be kind of supporting the First Amendment, no matter, you know, even when it is offensive, and even though I did push the envelope. Um, and the and, irony was lost on them, apparently. Well, you know, I don't know. I don't know the group as that well. Well, I, what, what was the nature of that conversation like? They, they said, you should be fired, you should be suspended because why? I mean, I think just for all the reasons that we talked about, that, that I would, they, they interpreted the column to mean that I was actually calling for um, you know, radical destruction, particularly to <laughs> low-income communities. I mean, th it's just ridiculous. I, I I'm not going to I'm not going to say it's ridiculous that's well, how they that's, interpreted that's it and I'm so here. did a lot of people so. Yeah so I'm I'm calling for a hurricane I mean uh, just uh, the quality of thinking in journalism and politics is strikingly banal to me I don't know if you find that or if you want to comment on that <laughs> I think I've said quite enough. Okay so uh, that's not your only controversial column you've gotten yourself in trouble with the powers that be previously when you dared to suggest that Tiny Dancer, uh, the mayor of Chicago, uh, was arrogance without portfolio. This was in advance of his reelection this past spring. And um, that generated a response and some calls to the Tribune honchos from the powers, from, from kind of the associated combine elements that are on the Democrat side. Um, what, what is the posture of the Tribune, your role in holding the most powerful politicians in this state accountable, and the reaction when their handmaidens put pressure on you or your editorial board to say, hey, 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 you're not allowed to question, you're not allowed to attack in the way that you did, Mayor Rahm Emanuel? Um, it's, it's listened to, and then promptly we move on. I mean, they, we allowed um, his good friend David Axelrod to write a response piece that he, you know, tried to take me down in a response piece, which was fine. I mean, that that is what the opinion pages are for. They're really for everyone. So I, I had no problem with with anything in his piece or the fact that he wanted to write um, write me back. Um, I mean, I, I don't think that reaction from the mayor's office really tempers what we do at all, either on the editorial side or on the news side. I mean, nobody has took a t taken a tougher look at the Emanuel administration than some of the reporters in the Tribune newsroom who have you know tracked the red light camera story put people in jail tried to get his you know meeting notices who he raises money from how he spends his time filed suit to get uh, filed lawsuits text messages and emails that he's not turning over gosh where have I heard that storyline <laughs> I mean but that's that's not even something I mean, we have even when the newsroom did which I think was some of the best reporting that I've read in a decade, broken bonds, and then follow-up mm -hmm. CPS, where we really uncovered for the first time, even for the city, even for city officials, the true extent of the debt that we we're in and why this is so dangerous and how we're just borrowing upon borrowing. That took a year of reporting or more. It took, you know, our in-house lawyer, you know, dealing with the Emanuel administration. It took money to get those records, which were public documents that, that they tried not to release for years and years. Um, I think that 
pushback from the mayor's office is expected, but it does not, it does not dictate what we do. Well, so on that, you said earlier this idea that, uh, boy, after all of the destruction that has been wrought with Chicago Democrat control of state and city government, you would expect people maybe to be thinking a second time or taking a harder look at the representation they're supporting. And it really hasn't happened, not in any material way. Um, the other side of the aisle, Republicans, talk about this with your colleague John Cass all the time. Um, what do you ascribe to the Republican Party in terms of responsibility for not providing that alternative view that has gained much currency here? I mean, with the election of Bruce Rauner notwithstanding, um, a bit of a, a, perhaps a bit of an anomaly, overwhelming resources against a very weak incumbent who barely won election four years ago, 30,000 votes against a relatively inept campaign that was run by Bill Brady in 2010. And yet, we, and despite all that, uh, one seat picked up in the Senate, zero in the House when Bruce Rauner's go, uh, kind of going away victory over Quinn in November of 2014. Uh, the balance of power in Chicago, I still see Rahm Emanuel. I still see Tony Preckwinkle. I still see the same balance of power in the Cook County Board. Um, I mean, there, there hasn't been that much change, even though it's easy for people to focus on the governor. And we've got an incumbent U.S. Senator in Mark Kirk, who is in probably a fight he's going to lose for re-election. I mean, at least that's what a lot of prognosticators, myself included, would suggest. So what kind of responsibility does the Republican Party bear in your estimation? What have they done or not done that leaves them in this super minority position in a state that has been controlled by one party for generations and is, uh, features the worst state and city government in the country? Well, I think a couple things. One thing on paper, I do think the map is really tough to beat, and I know there are people in the Republican Party who say, "No, no, no, we're getting closer." You know, we we if, as long as we have really good candidates, we can beat some of these Democrats. But we were in decided minorities. We, because I'm I'm a Republican by necessity, I'm a conservative by choice. Um, but the Republicans were in the minority, decided minority before the 2010 remap. But the but the map is uh, horrific. I mean, I don't know how else to describe it. It is. It is morally unjust, if you ask me. Well, I, it, I don't disagree. It's I mean, a the, disaster. The, 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 I mean, the, the whole process is. But Mike Madigan is the longest serving state house speaker in the history of the United States. I'm not telling you anything you don't know. Right. But you can't look at this and, and say, oh, the last four years, it's the map. Yeah, I, the map is very difficult. No, I, I'll, I'll finish. OK, sorry. Okay. There's the paper part, which is the map, which okay. is difficult to, to overcome. And having gone through all the endorsements of these House and Senate seats, I meet a lot of these candidates up close. And the Republicans are running great candidates. Um, so that's not the problem. The map is a big problem in winning seats. The other issue is I don't think Republicans do a good job at all of trying to drive home the message that they actually, you know, the Democrats do not have um, a singular voice of representing the middle class. And the Republican Party has done a terrible job of connecting bad fiscal policy by the Democrats and how that hurts low income working people in the state. And that is a connection that they have not done well. I don't think Governor Rauner is doing it well. And until they can make sort of a connection where people get when I spew out these pension numbers and then they understand, oh, well, that's why we didn't have money for Medicaid. That's why we don't have money for the developmentally disabled. That's why we have a bill backlog and people aren't getting paid. That's why people are leaving the state. And I, I don't think the party has done a good job. What about, there. I, there's, it seems to me you have a bit of a hollowing out of the city and the state. You've got uh, people that are very wealthy that are insulated from terrible public policy and you've got people that are working or, or, or poor or uh, somehow re rely on state services through no fault of their own, like the developmentally disabled, and you don't have a lot in the middle. And that, that middle seems to be continuing to disappear as middle income families say, I, I gotta get out of here, I can't afford to be here anymore. So it seems to me that if the Republican Party is ever gonna be the majority party in this state again, it has to be a party of the suburbs, suburban Cook County, particularly Northwest suburban Cook County and the Collar counties, and it's not right now. And so what about the idea that kind of the people who play by the rules, middle income families in this eight million person Chicago metropolitan area, they don't have representation by either party and the real failure of the Republican party is not just the competition to, to uh, exhibit who can 
uh, offer the most empathy to those on the bottom end of the socioeconomic spectrum, but also who is going to actually take up the banner for those middle income families who play by the rules, who finance all of this largesse to the extent that it's financeable. Yes. I mean, and when, when if you look at the city and you talk about hollowing out, um, middle income families are leaving Chicago. And, and to me, one of the biggest alarm bells when we talk about crime and we talk about the south and west sides where we have a serious crime problem, the emptying out of once stable middle income African American neighborhoods like South Shore, Chatham, Chicago Lawn, when you have those neighborhoods becoming destabilized and all of those people who have resources moving out to Evergreen Park and Oak Lawn and Orland Park, that is a very dangerous um, situation that we have in the city and it's going completely ignored. I mean, no, I don't see anything from the administration in that regard and it's hard even for me to credit like some of the aldermen with working really hard to try to keep their communities safe and stable. It seems to me that a question should be asked of these minority aldermen, uh, the mayor, uh, his politician police chief, Gary McCarthy. Um, to, can, can, we just, can we just dispense with this idea that we care about poor families who don't have a voice? Can we, can we, just, can we just stop with a hand wringing? I'm so concerned about uh, black people that are caught in the crossfire in places like Inglewood. I'm so, I'm so concerned about Hispanics that are caught in the crossfire in Pilsen and Little Village. No, you're not. And you know how you're not? You know how I know you're not? Is because I look at what's happening. I don't care what you say. I see what you do, or more to the point, don't do. And after all of the national attention that was focused on Chicago in 2012, when we had you know, a historically high murder rate, particularly compared to what's going on in the rest of the country, now, Four years later, five years into Tiny Dancer's reign, we're right back where we were in 2012. So what exactly has been accomplished? And where are the resources if you're so concerned about your first responsibility, the first responsibility of government at every level to provide for the physical security of your constituents? If you're so concerned about that, where, where are the resources to quell the violence? I mean, is, is that a fair criticism? Where these minority aldermen that preen before the cameras, these hashtag campaigns, all this other nonsense, mow mowing guns, and you know, uh, how Look, is it? How is it that Chicago has a higher murder per capita rate than New York and L.A. combined? New York and L.A. have minority communities too. Well, they are not as deeply segregated as Chicago. And why is that? New York does well, have. Why is that? We we'll just stop right there. Why is Chicago more segregated than those other countries? We've had we've had enlightened Chicago Democrat control of Chicago for 90 years. What? Well, well, why has the promise of Brown versus Board of Education not been realized in the city of Chicago? These Democrats that care so much about uh, those that have been truly, truly victimized by uh, government policies, by racist government policies, African Americans in particular. Why has this not been remedied? 90 years isn't enough time? I don't know that it can be remedied. I think, again, there are some solutions when you talk about New York. New York has a very, very tough UUW law. You are caught illegally with a weapon. Oh. You, no, 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 no. You are caught illegally with a weapon, you get an automatic year prison sentence. I generally do not favor mandatory minimums. I generally favor judicial discretion. But there have been too many cases in Chicago. We have tracked them at the Tribune of people who they know that if they get caught with a gun, they're gonna get a smack on the wrist. It's almost as a sign of stature in the community. It's kind of a rite of passage to, to spend some time at Cook County. Um, so there's a cultural issue there that I do think could be addressed legislatively with tightening up our unlawful use of a weapons law. Anita Alvarez, and, she's a Latina. She's the Cook County State's Attorney. She could push harder. She, she has, but you have judges who are very reticent on a first time offender who is a young black male to throw them behind bars. And who, who appoints those judges to the Cook County Circuit Courts? <laughs> Madigan and Burke? Well, look, so back to, back to your broader point. There is something legislatively that can be done. And then if you look at city leaders, I mean, if I were mayor, the first thing I would have done when I was elected in 2011 would have been to try to break down these silos that government operates under. North side aldermen need to care about what is happening on the west and south side. This is a citywide problem. What can Brendan Riley or Harry Osterman or Michelle Smith do to try to leverage some of the, you know, robust development in their wards 
to the south and west side wards where there is nothing. There is no communication among them. There is this turf mentality that if something happens on that side of the tracks, it's not my problem. It's a feudal system. It's so, their system. But, but it doesn't they like it. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be that way. All it would take would be some leadership oh. to try to bring some of these groups together. The, you know, the, but this is like the old, uh, uh, the old joke in economics, and uh, it's a bad joke because it's related to economics. But uh, the old joke, you're at a, you come to a ravine, how do you get to the other side? The economist says, well, assume a bridge. Well, this is you know, where we have this problem in the city of Chicago. We've had one party rule for 90 years. Well, what are your we, solutions? We, and, what and, are your and solutions? And we're going to assume leadership that doesn't exist. No, I'm just saying if I were mayor, I would have started honing in on these hot spot communities immediately and put every resource of City Hall to yes. focus on them. Streets and sands, cultural affairs, family services, homelessness, um, tree trimming. I don't care what it is. Police department. Every, every single resource at my fingertips would be honed in on these neighborhoods. During the summer, you live downtown. How often do you see groups of Chicago police officers in groups of three or four walking up and down Michigan Avenue? All the time, because I live right in Streeterville, so I see it all the time. And, and I don't blame those police officers because they're being deployed there. That's a choice by leadership. Well, that's what I'm saying. Leadership. That's what I'm saying. But it takes, they're being deployed there too because the alderman also wants a heavy sure. presence on Michigan. But we, we have to be reasonable. Those resources are, are necessary in other parts of the city. and. You know, the ter that's what I'm talking about when I talk about the turf battles. Well, Some of these other aldermen yes. need to give a little bit and recognize that what happens on the south side does matter to downtown. But this is, to borrow a Gloria Steinemism, this is like uh, suggesting that a fish should ride a bicycle. They're not going to do it. Well, the feudal I don't believe that. The feudal system, uh, 90 years of evidence, no! They, they, just, they just haven't seen the light. They don't know what's happening. They know what's happening. They don't care. They're protecting their little feudal I, I disagree. Turf. I think they do care. I mean, you, and you well, can't... What, what's the are, evidence of it? Well, you, you can't paint with a broad brush either. I mean, there are aldermen who, rep, who are representing some very tough neighborhoods who are working really hard to bring economic development, like Anthony Beal. He has... He fought... He had to he fight fought to, to get, get his daughter into Whitney Young. He had I know to that. fight to get Walmart. He had to fight the unions in order to bring economic development to his ward. He's got a soap factory there. Pullman Park is going to be a national park. These are improvements. I mean, you can yeah. shake your head, it's, yeah, but there is, are aldermen is, out there trying failing. to I, I got, stabilize their communities, and it's working. It's Roseland is a stable community it, today. It's bailing out the Titanic with a teaspoon. It, it, you, you are not going to save, in my estimation, these wards. You're not going to provide opportunity to people by having a big box come in or putting Whole Foods in Inglewood. I'm sorry, Ingle Wheel, as the very in touch mayor refers to that neighborhood. Well, what Wheel. do we do then? Since you have such strong opinions that none of this would work, what are, what are your solutions? Um, I would say eliminate institutional racism as practiced by the Chicago Democrats. The institutional racism is the feudal Chicago public school system and it is the resources as it pertains to public safety. Um, I don't care about Maggie Daly Park. I don't care about a stadium for DePaul at McCormick Place. I don't care about all of these other gambits, all the construction going on in my neighborhood for a headway to Navy Pier and all this stuff. I understand the economic engines and the tourist traps for the Chicago, and I understand that's important. But I also understand that a human life is more important than going to Harry Carey's and the Ferris wheel. Right, I and, understand and, and, and that too, those, and those, what do you do I know you it? understand that, but, but you cannot tell me. I just, I refuse to believe it because I see what they do. You cannot tell me that they are prioritizing it. The ruling class Pauls are prioritizing in the same way that we're describing it because we see what they do. We see where the money spend is. We see what the arguments are every time we have the uh, Darian Albert, the Hadia Pendleton, and it's a spike and everybody rushes and they have a vigil and they pass out t-shirts and then we wait three months until we do the next one bring overwhelming resources to those neighborhoods where we know the majority of violent crime is occurring. It is not complicated. Well, Overwhelming resources, and if that means everything else in the city of Chicago has to be shut down or put on hold, people need to be laid off so that we can clear more resources for police, 
that you do whatever is required because that is your number one responsibility and you can't do this, I'm, I'm over here, but I'm also trying to get this to Paul Stadium done. No, 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 no. Right. Everybody's no, focus, I, I like a wedge, you. needs to be there. And it also, importantly, if you wanna talk about real opportunity, long-term structural reform, real opportunity, it is to provide children in those neighborhoods with the same educational opportunities that Tiny Dancer has for his children, that Barack Obama had for his children, that all of the politicians have for their children to send them to schools that are not CPS schools with a few exceptions so that they can maintain their political office in the city or the county. Right, but and that's and that's not happening either. And Rom promised transformational I know. change. You started out this conversation based on my column that I wrote about him. Right, where I discussed all of these issues. Right, that I know. There's a lot of a lot of arrogance being thrown around, and and frankly, that arrogance bleeds into their police strategy, where they won't call in state police, they won't call in FBI. I mean, I've been one who I'm not opposed to bringing in the National Guard, yeah, and I've talked to them. Well, anyway, the point Posse being, comitatus, counselor. If you. If these killings of babies and children were happening in a white neighborhood on the north me? side, it are you would be me? all full court press, and we are so numb if to it. If this was happening in my ward, I mean, you, you, you would you would have you. For, we would be removing the troops from Afghanistan to put in Streeterville. Right, I know. Because Ron would call in, you know, scramble the birds, President Obama. We got to protect Streeterville. We got to protect Navy Pier. You know, people have to have a good time at Bubba Gump's. That's what's important. I, so, 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 which is it though? This goes back to this idea. No, no, no. These aldermen need to do this, and the mayor needs to do that. They are hardwired to not do it. It is not going to happen. And so, the message should be: Stop pretending that people who have showed you who they are are going to be someone else, and start telling people in this city, all these lakefront libs, that you have a choice to make. Here is the stark reality. You are either on the side of this craven, destructive, barbaric political class, <laughs> or you're on the side of providing I, opportunities I know, for people that don't have opportunities like you had. Which is it gonna be? I understand. That's the choice I'm that should be made. I'm trying to give you um, a range of things that need to be done to start turning the city around that are doable. But it's not doable. It's it, not doable, it if, they're, doable. If, they're, if, they're, if they're preternaturally unwilling to do it. I don't so why think do, they why, are. why do we Be continue to, to you, you bound our heads broad, against that wall of cement? You can't paint with a broad brush that they're all not willing to do it. I mean, some of these aldermen have tried all kinds of things. Are they, in some places, they're working. I mean, I live on the south side. It's not, it is not all a hellhole. I, I mean, know. Some of, their, some of these aldermen are very determined and are working hard and are going to the funerals of working these people. Hard. These are their Everybody neighbors. works oh, hard. I, I don't, you can't just write off um, all of them Aldermen as being, working hard. I mean, I, seriously, you know, the, I'm, I'm working hard in my community. I go to these meetings and I say this and I bring it to the mayor's office. I understand that, you know, an individual can only accomplish so much and you need to be kind of That's a, all I'm trying a to philosophical say. leader and an, an intellectual leader. And you need to get others that are like minded to do the same. But it doesn't seem to me that that is welcome in the real, the real, the upper reaches of power of the Democratic Party, because otherwise, I mean, how long does it take? For, you, you talk about, and I agree with you, about if this was happening in the 42nd Ward or Lincoln Park, I mean, this, everything would be on shutdown until those situations got resolved. Right. Well, um, if it was their children, if it was Rahm Emanuel's kids at lab school, lab school was having a little violence problem, kids weren't safe there, you think that would be remedied? I mean, it, it seems to me that the Democrats are just very cavalier. Democrats in charge of this city and state and have been for a long time, very cavalier with other people's lives. Forget other people's money, that's obvious. Other people's lives. Uh, you're 13 year old, you're 14 year old. Hey, we're working on it. Well, we hope to remedy it. I'm working hard every day. I go to bed thinking about this and, and, and then I wake up to do nothing about it. But if it was their kids whose future was on the line, It'd be a bit of a different story, wouldn't it? I don't disagree with you. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's a sad. It's a, just a sad commentary, and it doesn't seem like we get straight talk from, uh, well, from most in the media. You cast a few exceptions, uh, and certainly here again, the failure of the party I call home. Uh, any alternative vision for what Chicago could be. We couldn't even come up with a center right candidate to put up against a weak incumbent named Rahm Emanuel last cycle. So the Republican Party, my party, uh, bears a lot of responsibility for this as well. 
Right. I mean, Rahm's runoff candidate was to his left, you know, right. ran to his left, more yeah. spending. So, you know, that's why when you Wilson talk about howling candidate. into the wind, that's sort of what it feels like um, to be a fiscal conservative in the city and to care about these issues, but, you know, be sort of unheard. Now, let's level this up to the state uh, state government as well, because, as you mentioned, you do these sit downs with state legislative candidates. They're not sexy races all the time. They don't gain a lot of, you know, general uh, metro attention, but they're very important for what kind of state government we have. They're important for the communities where these competitive races are run. And I wonder what your reaction was to Governor Edgar, the vaunted, sainted Governor Edgar, uh, weighing in on the current budget impasse and suggesting that Bruce Rauner stop holding the budget hostage <laughs> uh, because people are hurting. Uh, is that a fair assessment of where this budget impasse is at, that Governor Rauner is holding the budget hostage, so said Governor Edgar? No, I mean, I we had an editorial kind of calling Governor Edgar out. I think it has to be acknowledged that he's not offering up these opinions, just he's not holding a press conference and off. You know, reporters are approaching him and calling him and he's responding, just for what it's worth. Um, Governor Edgar repeating Mike Madigan's talking points, that's not really surprising. I mean, the two of them operated together in government in a very different era when there was more money to be thrown around. It was. And, uh, you know, by Governor Edgar instituting a pension ramp like he did, he, he looked like yeah. the hero to bring pensions in line, which of course never even happened. The Democrats never paid attention to the ramp. And the ramp was, you know, severely backloaded, which was not a surprise to anyone who was down there when they passed it. But, um, I mean, he was always a very moderate Republican, so I guess I'm not terribly surprised that he would pick up Mike Madigan's mantle. I'd suggest something, too, as somebody who's been in the party and party politics for the time, you know, since Edgar left office in 98 to present, um, that, uh, boy, it always struck me through the 2010 cycle, 12 years after he left office, Republican Party was always looking to break Jim Edgar out of the emergency glass and have him <laughs> run for governor again, have him run for U.S. Senate, rather than build infrastructure, uh, develop a farm well, team. Beg him to run. Beg him yes, to run. Yeah. Yes, beg him. Right. And everything else had to be, you know, everybody, you, everybody stay put because we might be able to get Jim Edgar back. <laughs> and wouldn't that be super? Uh, and so that also stunted the growth of the Republican Party. It pushed a lot of Republicans or people who are center rightists or fiscal conservatives, even and, and conservatives across the board, out of the party. They just don't want to have nothing to do with it. And, and you see this still to this day. People think that Ron are winning, so there's just kind of this magical immediate turnaround. You go to Republican events like I do around the state. I remember going to, for example, the New Trier Dinnery, New Trier Township on the leafy North Shore, cobblestone streets. It's lovely. Uh, I've never been. Yeah, well, you know, Southside girl can dream. Uh, I remember going there in the mid '90s, some of my first campaigns. Fifteen hundred people. Today, just recently, the new troop dinnery with Governor Rauner, you know, Winnetka boy, uh, as uh, their keynote. Hundred people. So this idea that winning the governor's race suddenly turns around the trajectory of the party and by extension the trajectory of the state is folly and it seems to me that republicans are still unwilling to do the hard work and that's why you have the jim edgars hanging around because you don't have intellectual leadership from durkin you don't have intellectual leadership from Rodonio. they're legislative leaders for republicans you didn't have it with cross before durkin certainly they continue to be the handmaidens to the democratic party and so it's just easier to cut the deal and let madigan substantially have his way because there's no future in being a republican in illinois that's what a lot of republicans believe and jim edgar is their spokesman there is a different there are different subsets of republicans in this state though this is not wisconsin a third of the Republican caucus in Springfield are pro-union Republicans. So you can you can wish for a time when there is this unified message that is more similar to yours, but it's just not real. It's what, just, what, it what, doesn't exist. Wisconsin, you mean the birthplace of public sector unions? I'm just saying um, when people compare Rauner to Scott Walker and, and can't figure out why he couldn't get reforms or collective bargaining changes, 
this is a very it is a different state. No, but but it's not that's not Rauner's fault. That that's the fault of Republican leadership in the House and the Senate. Why are they in the super minority? Walker was able to do what he was able to do because he had Republican control of the Wisconsin state legislature. But they are representing actual human beings, voters and constituents in downstate Illinois who are Republicans and yes. are pro union in their hearts. Yeah, that's okay. That's that's, that's what they do. Yeah, so, that's right. So that But they're misrepresenting them. I, I don't think so. I, I think it's probably very difficult to be Durkin and Redonio at different times when you are trying to keep these two interests aligned. It's not, a, it's not the same Republican Party that you represent. Everything's difficult. Everything's difficult. And if it's too difficult, then they should step aside so somebody else could do it if it's just too challenging for them. I would say this. Um, there's different philosophies on representation. One is to be a weather vane. And just to wherever 50% plus one of your constituents are at any point in time, that's where you're going to be. The other is the Edmund Burke model, which is you elect me for my judgment. And I'm going to support policies and advance policies consistent with my judgment as I explained it in the campaign. And now as I'm going to pursue it as a legislator. Uh, the Republican Party has been the weather vane party. And it finds them in the super minority. Maybe, maybe, particularly at the leadership level, Maybe it's time to be the judgment party, the wisdom party. What about that? You, you hold out no hope that the Republican Party can be the uh, wisdom I party? Just, I don't think everything is as easy as you would like it well, I, to be uh, framed. Uh, I already it, talked. Well, I it's never easy. How, well, well, uh, but, right. but, it's, and, but it's what path are you going to pursue? That's the question. Well, what do you want them to do that they aren't doing? What do you want the Durkins and Redonios of the world to be doing that they aren't? Put in the fight. They, they're, they're running really strong candidates. They're trying to raise money. Um, that's, that's part of it. I'm talking about the put in the fight by presenting an alternative view of the role of government in a free society. And I'm not, and now that sounds abstract and airy, but make it concrete. We are going to be a party unequivocally for school choice at the K through 12 level. That is a moral issue for us. That is, to borrow a phrase, our values and this is a line, and everybody is going to toe this line. Why, can, why does Madigan, why is he able to make his caucus toe the line on issues that he wants the well, line he's towed? He's having some trouble there, too, but I don't disagree Limited. with you on school choice. Well, that's a one where's example. Your bill? That's, well, that, but, where, where's your school choice legislation? But, that you, but, but, so, but this is an example. After it rose up, James Meeks got pushed the ball along. Yeah. The Republican Party has completely ignored it. Well, not all Republicans. You've had some backbenchers like Jeannie Ives that have advanced school choice, Tom Morrison that have advanced school choice legislation. I've been hearing about school choice legislation for two or three years that has not materialized, but, but what, despite great effort supposedly going into but, it. But what you're telling me, what you're, what you're reflecting back on me is my criticism of the Republican Party. They're not really serious. They take rhetorical positions that they walk away from five minutes later. And so how does anybody look at the Republican Party and understand it as a brand to deliver a certain promise, like school choice. Like, for example, everybody singing from the same hymnal saying, we are 47th in the nation in providing services to developmentally disabled. One of the values of the Republican Party is we take care of people who, through no fault of their own, cannot take care of themselves. That's what state government's for. So our focus is going to be going from 47 to 1. And so between school choice and going from 47 to 1, and some of the economic issues that are in Ronner's turnaround agenda. That is going to be our focus. Everybody better get in line. If you don't get in line, there will be punishment to be paid or there will be challenge. In other words, we're going to primary you. We're going to find somebody who will get in line. We're going to find somebody who is Those a little bit more courageous. Conversations do take place. The conversations take place, super minority. Some of those conversations worked in, in trying to beat back like Senate Bill 1229. Um, Again, I go back to the map. I don't know what 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 else you're looking for. They are running good, strong candidates against some of these Democrats. What what, what is it? I mean, as somebody who's covered Chicago politics, Illinois politics for two decades. Am I aging uh, you before your time? Let's not age me. Yeah. Fifteen. Years? Fifteen years. Roughly. Uh, what is it that people should understand about the political culture in this state that you don't think they have properly internalized? I think people believe that lawmakers are policy driven and that they, you know, that good intentions carry them really far. Um, and there isn't a lot of outcome from a lot of these lawmakers. So, you know, I credit someone like Andy Menar, 
who is a Democrat freshman from outside of Springfield, for tackling school funding. He was a freshman, he traveled the state, he met with a, a bunch of superintendents, he crafted a very controversial bill. I mean, he took on a really complex issue. You can take issue with the results, but there well, aren't to, enough to people- to raid suburban school districts. There aren't enough lawmakers down there who are willing to take on controversial issues or complex issues. It's so easy to just get by down there, to go to your pancake breakfast, yeah. back home, to answer constituent service calls, to show up for your committee hearings, um, and to you know get paid pretty well and get a nice pension and, and some you know stature. It's really easy to just coast. And I think people don't realize that that's what the great majority of them down there do. Do you think that uh, Chicago media, as well as the Springfield Press Corps, do you think they cover state government as effectively as it should be covered so that people understand what is and what is not happening and why? Yeah, I think they do. I mean, I I can talk about my own newsroom. It, there, the impact of the stories, I think, is not as great as people would like. I think we're very numb to corruption. I point to a story Ray Long at the Tribune did a few weeks ago where he found out that, you know, Mike Madigan had buried $7 million in Secretary of State Jesse White's budget to build a new school in his own district. When you have, you know, all across the state, especially in Chicago and on the northwest and southwest sides, people waiting with their hands out for state money to build like portable classrooms. And here the speaker hides this money over here and builds his own school. Where was the outrage? I mean, so these things get covered. We've covered Madigan's business dealings. We've covered his patronage. We've covered him as it related to the Metro scandal. We've covered his son and the jobs that he's gotten out of it. When are we gonna get his tax returns? I mean, he's a millionaire. We can set that aside. But the, but the point is, I, I don't think it's the media that is being complicit. I think it's voters who are just so numb to these types of stories that they have you know, very little impact. Was there any uprising in the Democratic caucus among members whose schools are waiting for money that the speaker just swooped in and set this little pot aside for himself? I sure didn't see it. We get the representation we deserve. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I agree with that. Uh, last question, play political prognosticator for a moment. How does this budget impasse end and when does it end? I don't think it ends until January or February of next year because um, lawmakers aren't even going to be back in spring. Every, everyone's done talking about the budget, actually. I mean, the, the House and Senate were in, in We today. tried to get one. We didn't. No, Let's they, go they're home. not even trying. They're just doing like ancillary issues now. Um, and now it's just like a, a sitting out waiting period. They did this last year where it wasn't until they act, the state actually started to run out of money where they had talks about sweeping funds and they did all this you know, um, patchwork basically to fix the budget. I see that happening. Um, I don't see either side giving in. There is still you know, this belief that Rauner is introducing ideas that are, should be off the table, which I think is ridiculous, but there's a lot of support for that. And you've got you know, the massive ego of Mike Madigan. He's not gonna back down on any of this. And do you expect if the balance of power in the General Assembly does not change uh, in the next three years that this is going to be what we see between the governor and the General Assembly for the next three years? It could be. It could. I don't know. All right. She is Krista McQuarrie. Thanks so much for joining us on this edition of Against the Current. Appreciate it. Awesome.